Hello and welcome to lecture number 34 of the course theory of computation. Uh, so, in the past lecture, lecture number 33, we started with uh, decidable languages. We talked about decidable languages um, that were built on uh, regular languages, right? And in this lecture, we will talk about decidable problems that are built on context free languages, right? So, just like we saw uh, acceptance problem. Uh, of uh, regular languages, the first thing that we will see is acceptance problem of a context free language. Right? So, give, so, meaning we are, so the, it is a CFG. So, we are given a context free grammar G and a string W and we are asked whether this context free grammar uh, generates this string W. Right? Here again, uh, the naive way that one may guess, right? So, is, so we have the grammar, right? So, we have some uh, variables, some rules, some production rules, etc. Um, we could try uh, generating various possibilities, right? So, from the start variable, you try all kinds of possibilities and you look and you check whether the given string w is generated by the grammar. But uh, the problem is, um, it is not clear when to stop, right? Because there are so many possibilities, there could be so many possibilities and it is not clear when you are supposed to stop and which which branches you take like when to stop etc. Right? So, you can try out some simple ways then some other ways, some other ways and so on, but it is not clear when you stop. Right? Um, this, so if you never get the string w, um, if, you, if, if by chance you happen to get the string w in one of these derivations, then you can say yes g that generates w and you can accept. But if you do not see it, then uh, till how long will you keep trying out things, right? So, meaning uh, if w is not generated by g, you will never, uh, you will never possibly halt, right? Uh, so, that is also an issue, right? So, that is why I am saying here that uh, this idea may be, uh, may result in a uh, recognizer, but cannot provide it decider because if w is not generated by g, it, it, there is no clear way to uh, reject, right. Um, but so, the problem here is that we do not know when to stop, right. So, if there are some derivations that you can try and then we say, okay, we tried many things, but now we are sure that w is not generated by g, that, that should be a good uh, thing, right. So, is there some something that will give us a guarantee that if you try these gen, uh, gen, uh, these possible derivations, these possible generations and you never got the string w, now you are never going to get w. Like, suppose there is such a guarantee, like you try this and if you cannot get w till this point, then you are not going to get it. If that guarantee is there, then we can build a decider. But that guarantee is given to us by the Chomsky normal form, right. So, if you recall, uh, we saw Chomsky normal form in second chapter, right. And importantly, we saw that all, suppose a string is of length n, right? String is of length n, then any derivation using the Chomsky normal form must take exactly 2n minus 1 steps. Any derivation of that string must take exactly 2n minus 1 steps, meaning if the string is of length 10, it must exactly use 19 steps, not more, not less, exactly 19 steps. So, what we can do is, um, so, we have the grammar, we have some uh, variables, some rules, etc. You can simply try all possible derivations of 19 steps, right. So, you start with the start variable, you try out all possible uh, ways to replace the start variable by another uh, using a rule. Then each of these possibilities you try out uh, all possible next steps and all possible next next steps and so on. But if you know that you only have to try out 2n minus 1 steps. So, suppose the string as I said is of length 10, then we know that we only have to try out all possible derivations of 19 steps. So, we can do that, we can try out all possible derivations of 19 steps because we have to, we may have to try out all possible, but we know that we can stop after 19 steps. If we do not get w after 19 steps, we know we are not going to get it in the future because w is of length 10. If we do not see w in 19 steps, we are not going to see it after 21 or 25 steps, right? So, 
this helps us build a decider right what we do is um, given a grammar we can convert into chomsky normal form this also something that is something that we have seen in second chapter all grammars can be reduced can be converted to chomsky normal form an equivalent chomsky normal form right which means whatever is accepted by g will be accepted by the uh, grammar in chomsky normal form and whatever is not accepted will not be accepted right and now you list out all possible derivations of 2n minus 1 steps so this is important in the chomsky normal form you try out all possible derivations of length 2n minus 1 if uh, um, um, if if the string that we like so you you are given an input g and w and you are asked whether g generates w right so if if w is empty string so now 2n minus 1 will be minus 1 so it doesn't make sense but if it is empty string there has to be a rule start gives empty string right so if it is empty string then you just check whether uh, you check all the derivations of length 1 right otherwise you check all the derivations of length 2n minus 1 and then see whether w is generated in any of these derivations if it is generated you accept meaning there is some uh, rule or some set of se rules applied in some sequence generating w if w is not generated that means it is like we have tried up to 2 and minus 1 steps it is not going to be generated later also so you can safely reject right so what you do is we we convert the grammar into chomsky normal form list all the possible derivation of 2n minus 1 steps and accept if w is generated and reject if it is not generated right so the earlier way did not give us the confidence to reject if it was not generated because there, there is simply no guarantee that we will we will be done after doing this many steps and chomsky normal form is able to provide that assurance okay and one more point is one more related point is that we have actually seen an even more efficient algorithm uh, which was a cyk algorithm in the second chapter in fact the in the cy uh, in the book the cyk algorithm appears in the seventh chapter i think but uh, for for the purpose of this course i think we advanced it and we covered in the second chapter so in fact given a gr grammar g and a string w the grammar g being in uh, chomsky normal form we saw an efficient way to uh, check whether w is generated by this grammar right? so cyk is even more efficient than uh, blindly uh, trying out all possible derivations of length 2 and minus 1 so it uses a very uh, dynamic programming approach which is much more uh, which is much more uh, clever and smart you don't have to you you end up saving a lot of work that you would otherwise redo right so cyk algorithm is actually another way to uh, decide this but since the question is whether we can decide or whether it is not decidable uh, even the algorithm that is listed here will do right so we are not really at this point we are not really optimizing on the resources okay so that completes uh, acfg acfg is decidable the next is ecfg so given a grammar does it generate a, or does it generate the empty language in other words given a grammar is there even one string that it generates right um, if you recall in the previous lecture we showed that edfa is decidable right so we said that uh, you cannot possibly try out all possible um, string whether that string is accepted by the dfa instead we looked at the dfa as a graph right we looked at dfa as a graph and checked whether any accepting state is reachable from the starting state right based on this we decided so the 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 in the case of ecfg it it's similar uh, we we can for the same reason as why we could not uh, do edfa by brute brute force checking each string whether it is accepted by the dfa for the same reason we cannot check if each string whether it is accepted or generated by the grammar right so we know that a c f g is decidable but we cannot keep doing like first string whether this string is generated by this grammar second string whether second string is generated by this grammar if some string is generated then we know the language is not empty but if the language is indeed empty you will just keep checking string after another after another right there are infinite strings and you will never 
end. So there will, this will not be a uh, decider. Okay. So what we have to do is look at something, some other approach. So in the case of DFA, we we try to see, we try to view it as a graph and check whether this uh, this state is the accept or one of the accepting states is reachable from the starting state. So here we do is uh, uh, something which is similar in spirit. Right? So you want to know whether uh, any string is generated, right? So what we do is it may not be immediately. Um, it's it's slightly clever approach, right? So what we do is. So in the first tape, right? So as we know, multi tape was same as single tape. You list the rules of G, or you list the grammar G, right? Tape one. And tape two, what we do is, you initially list all the terminals. Let's say A, B, zero, one. Let's say these are your terminals. You list these things in tape two, right? Um, now what you do is this. Now you have this in a, in the tape two. Right? Tape one is just uh, tape one will just continue to store the grammar. Now you check. Is there any variable that will now you go through all the rules, all the rules one by one. Now suppose there is a rule that let's say A gives A B A, right? So now A gives a variable, A gives a, A derives a string that is entirely terminals, right? So which means the variable A is able to generate some string that is entirely terminals. So then we include A in tape two. Right, so we include a in tape two. So any variable that is able to generate a string of entirely terminals, we include here. Now suppose there is a rule, let's say b gives zero uh, zero a, right? Now we know that zero and zero are terminals, and variable a is capable of deriv deriving a string of entirely entirely terminals, right? So because a derives a b a. So basically, what we do is we check whether is there an is there now a rule, right? Where the right hand side is entirely in the tape two, right? So first the right hand the tape two contain only terminals. So now we ask whether the, the 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 like is there some rule where the right hand side is entirely in tape two? So now a and zero is there in tape two. So now we add b to the tape two, right? So suppose there is a there is a new rule where let's say c gives uh, d a right so then that you do not add c because uh, d is not in tape 2 right now suppose there is a rule let's say uh, let's say i don't know uh, e gives a b where a and b are both variables but both a and b are there in the tape 2 so now you can include e also in the tape 2 so like that we proceed right so you initially you, the tape two contains only terminals. You go through all the rules, and if any rule, if in any rule the right hand side is entirely in tape two, you add the left hand side also, the variable in the left hand side also, to the uh, to tape two. So basically, in, what I am saying here is, if in any rule, a rule is of this form, a gives u one, u two, etc. Maybe we'll just uh, move this slightly. Uh, a gives u1 u2 etc right now if all of u1 u2 so u1 u2 etc could be either symbols either terminals or variables right now if all of the right hand side are in the tape 2 you add a to the tape 2 otherwise you go through all the rules if one round you go through all the rules and you add no rule you are not able to add any rule to tape 2 or you are not able to add any variable to tape 2 then you stop if at least one variable you are able to add to tape two, you do another round, and in that round, if you are able to add something, you again uh, do another round, and you repeat till you are able to go to go through an entire round without adding any uh, variable to tape two. And when you so, which means at that point you cannot add any more variables, right? So because you added, you didn't add any anything. You, even if you do one more round, it's not going to make a change. So the point is. Tape two contains those those variables, so it contains terminals. It also contains those variables like a, b, and e, from which we can generate a string of terminals. 
So if you start with A, A is able to generate a string of terminals. If you start with B, B is able to generate 0, 0, A and where A can again generate a string of terminals. So A, B, E can generate a string of terminals. So the, the variables in tape 2 are those from which we can generate a string of terminals. Now, now you are done with the, the, the process. All you have to check whether is check now is is the start variable able to generate a string of entirely terminals right so, right? so that is the, the language what is the language the language is simply uh, the set of all strings right so l of g for a grammar is nothing but any string that is entirely composed by terminals which is derived from the start variable so now we, we are asking whether the start variable can generate a string of terminals but then in tape 2 we are now maintaining a set of variables that can generate a string of only terminals so all you have to do is check if the start variable is there in the tape 2 if the start variable is there in tape 2 you you know that uh, the language is um, able, the start variable is able to generate a string of only terminals which means the language generated by the grammar is not empty it at least has one string which means you reject if if the start variable is there in tape 2 you reject if the start variable is not there in tape 2 you accept right so again we instead of addressing it directly in the naive way by trying out one string after other we we are we we we, we constructed a clever algorithm where you kept track of those variables from which we can generate a string of only terminals and then at the end you checked whether start variable is in that list if start variable is in that list the the language generated is not empty and then you reject if start variable is not in that list then you accept right so this is a algorithm for ecfg whether the grammar generates the empty language or not. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is um, theorem 4.9. I will just state the theorem. Uh, you can uh, read the proof in the book. It is very similar to ACFG or it rather it uses ACFG. It just says every context free grammar is decidable. Sorry, not context free grammar. What I meant is uh, every context free language is decidable. Every CFL is decidable. So given a context free language uh, and given a string but then you can check whether uh, the string is in the context free language or not. Um, so we will close with one or two small points. Uh, so in the case of uh, DFAs or regular languages we saw this uh, the fact that EQ DFA was decidable. It is a question whether two given DFAs are equivalent whether they recognize the same language. Now we can ask the same question for context free languages or context free grammars. Given two grammars G and H, do they generate the same language? Right? So given two grammars G and H, do they generate the same language? Now uh, the, 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 since we saw EQ DFA, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is can we use the same thing? Can we construct can we construct a, 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 a CFG which uh, generates exactly the symmetric difference of LA and LB, right? The answer is unfortunately no because DF, regular languages were closed under complement, intersection and union. So here notice that we are using complement here L of A complement, intersection for L of A complement, intersection L of B and over here another intersection, right? So we are using intersection and complement and also union. However, uh, context free languages are not closed under complement, they are not closed under intersection. So there is no way to build a context free grammar in general that will generate the intersection of uh, two context free grammars or that will generate the language which is the intersection of the two uh, uh, language generated by two different context free grammars. So we cannot use the same approach. So EQCFG, at least we cannot use the same approach. We will have to think of some other approach. 
because the context free languages are not closed under intersection and complement and unfortunately it turns out that uh, this is one language uh, which is not decidable in fact no approach works right so i'm not i'm not telling you why uh, i'm not telling you the proof but i'm just telling you now that it is undecidable right so right now for for now you have to take it as a fact maybe one of the later lectures maybe maybe next week or the next next week we'll see why it is undecidable and that completes the topics that i have uh, in decidable problems arising out of context free languages so we saw acfg um, where we converted the grammar into chomsky normal form and checked whether the given string is uh, generated by that grammar so the chomsky normal form gave us a bound on how many steps to check then we saw ecfg whether the given grammar generates the empty language right so we here we maintained a set of uh, variables which are able to generate a string of only terminals right not in one step but maybe in multiple steps and you uh, and and then we checked whether start variable is in that list right and then we use that to decide whether the grammar uh, generates empty language or not and uh, we said that eqcfg is uh, uh, cannot be we cannot use the same trick as eqdfa and in fact it is undecidable and that's all i have uh, in the that's all i have in uh, uh, the regular uh, the, sorry decidable languages decidable problems arising out of context free languages and now uh, in the next lecture we will move to uh, some some theory that we need to have um in order to show languages are undecidable so the next step is trying to understand uh, undecidable things so before that we need to understand certain other uh, mathematical theories so that we will see in the next lecture thank you